Hello there, today we're going to look at Decision Transformer Reinforcement Learning via Sequence Modeling by Lily Chen, Kevin Liu and others of UC Berkeley, Facebook AI Research and Google Brain. On a high level this paper ditches pretty much anything and everything of reinforcement learning in an offline RL setting and substitutes it for simple sequence modeling using transformers, of course. And through that, they're able to achieve some pretty compelling results in the things they test. At least they're able to keep up and be on par with the current best frameworks for doing offline reinforcement learning. So we're going to look at this paper and uh, at what it what it does in in terms of sequence modeling and how this looks. The key ingredient here besides the transformer is going to be the fact that we are instead of maximizing the reward, we're going to condition on the desired reward and uh, through that we we can sort of influence what the model is going to do in the future. This allows more effective offline reinforcement learning and makes the offline RL problem pretty straightforward into a sequence modeling problem. I do have a little bit of troubles with the paper in various aspects, but I'm sure we'll come to that. But I'm just warning you, this might be a bit of a rant mixed uh, with explaining the paper, though the paper is is pretty cool. So don't get me wrong on that. That being said, there is concurrent work also out of Berkeley, as I understand it, um, where it's this is called the tra trajectory transformer, reinforcement learning as one big sequence modeling problem that uses the sequence modeling in a bit of a different way. So what they do is they use it as sort of a world model, and then they use beam search in order to in, in order to find good trajectories in that. So it's a little bit of a different approach. And I just from skimming this paper right here, I think I this one might be a bit more of a of an approach that I would subscribe to. Um, but I guess we'll see what happens going forward. And Oh, wait, why did this show up? Reinforcement learning upside down by Schmidt Huber. Uh, this must just have gotten in here by accident. Sorry. Um, let's go back to this paper. They say we introduce a framework that abstracts reinforcement learning as a sequence modeling problem. This allows us to draw upon the simplicity and scalability of the transformer architecture and associated advances in language modeling, such as the GPT line and BERT. In particular, we present the decision transformer, an architecture that casts the problem of RL as conditional sequence modeling, unlike prior approaches that fit, fit value functions or compute policy gradients, Decision Transformers simply outputs the optimal actions by leveraging a causally masked transformer. Okay, so as I said, they ditch things like uh, policy gradients or value functions, none of that. Um, we're simply going to do sequence modeling right here. By conditioning on an autoregressive model on the desired return, past states and actions, our decision transformer model can get can generate future actions that achieve the desired return. So a key concept here is going to be this desired return thing and here as well. So there are multiple ingredients to this paper, there's a lot to to unpack right here. Um, and lastly, they say it achieves, uh, it, it matches or exceeds the performance of state of the art model free offline RL baselines. Again, this is sort of zooming down into a problem. So we are in the world of model free and offline reinforcement learning uh, algorithms. There is, as I said, there's a lot to un unpack here. So first of all, what is offline reinforcement learning? This is contrasted to online reinforcement learning. Online reinforcement learning is where you have an agent and an environment, and the agent sort of gets to perform actions in the environment and the environment responds with a reward and a state or the not really a state, but an, an observation, but we sometimes it is the state. Uh, if it's not a partially observable environment. So the agent actively gets to interact with the environment to try out things and its goal is going to be to maximize that reward. 
In offline reinforcement learning, it's a different situation. So in offline reinforcement learning, you are your agent is here. And what you get is not an environment, but what you get is a data set. And this data set will contain, it will contain lots of experience from other agents. So you would simply get to observe what a different agent has done. And so there's going to be a lot of like episodes in here. So what happened in the past to this other agent? And purely by observing that other agent, you somehow have to learn a good policy to achieve a good reward. This is different because you cannot go out and sort of test your hypotheses in this world. You cannot have a good idea and say, well, I'm going to try that. Um, you can't do sort of targeted exploration and so on. You simply get to look at a bunch of trajectories and then uh, decide what you want to do. So we need a bunch of different approaches here. And and uh, one that they compare to is so there are two that mainly that they compare to one is called they call it BC, which is behavior cloning, where what you're trying to do is you simply try to mimic the agent uh, that you observe in the events where it has led to to good rewards, right? So that's how you maximize the reward, you simply say, well, that agent there, it got a good reward. Uh, so I'm just going to try to sort of clone that behavior as behavior cloning from the name. I'm, I'm butchering the explanation, but roughly, that's what it's supposed to do. The other approach is you view this as a, let's say, more a traditional reinforcement learning problem where you do queue learning. So in queue learning, um, what you do is you are in a state and you have maybe like three actions at your disposal. And every time you again have three actions at your disposal. So you get this sort of tree that you could do. So you're in the first state. And what you want is you want to ask your queue function, uh, how much how much is how much is this worth? Maybe the Q function says five. How much is this worth? Six. And how much is this worth? Four. So the Q function is supposed to tell you if you um, take this action. And after that action, you follow the, the policy. Like after that action, you again do ask the Q function for the Q value, uh, which what's the total reward you're going to get. Q learning is very, very classic reinforcement learning algorithm. And you can actually do Q learning from a data set like this, it doesn't need to be uh, you yourself that makes the experience. That's the, the thing about Q learning is that it can be done from offline data other than policy gradients, uh, you need sort of a you need a correction. Um, if you do policy gradients, and it usually doesn't work if it's complete offline I, I, it might work. I'm not super informed like this. But Q learning is possible from offline data. And apparently the current a currently good baseline is conservative Q learning, um, which you're going to see in this paper, which uh, fixes the the um, the bug, let's say the, the tendency for for these Q functions in the offline setting to overestimate the Q value. So apparently, uh, they they tend to overestimate the value that you get from certain actions, conservative Q learning uh, is a more like a pessimistic approach. So these are the two baselines that we're going to compare to you'll notice behavior cloning some kind of relation to inverse reinforcement learning, not really or, or um, yeah, so so that's one approach Q learning uh, is also an approach here we're just going to do sequence modeling. So what does this mean? And the key concept, as I said, is going to be the condition on that reward. Uh, sorry, so so this was offline RL. Now, there are people have pointed out problems with the approach here, uh, which some of those problems are simply problems of offline reinforcement learning. So for example, which data set do you use right here? Turns out in their experiments, they use a, a benchmark data set, which is the the data set where this agent right here is a DQN learner, so an active reinforcement learner. So naturally, you're going to get out like some some good episodes out of that. So it's more like learning from expert demonstration, rather than from random, random demonstrations. Okay, so it's crucially important which data set you use. But that's 
that's a fault of offline RL of the setting itself, uh, rather than of this particular algorithm. So I just want to want to point that out. But keep in mind, the data set they're using for their main experiments is one of, let's say, a rather high performing agent in this world. Okay, so, so that's that. So the second thing right here is their um, their use of the of a transformer. Now, is the use of a transformer crucial to this algorithm? And the answer is is no. So whenever the transformer comes to mind, this can be any sequence modeling algorithm right here. Transformers are trendy, okay, um, but this can be an LSTM that does autoregressive sequence modeling. Anything that does sort of autoregressive sequence modeling is going to be good for this task right here. The, the core here is going to be this is a, a sequence model. It's not an, an RL model. In fact, transformers for RL have been a thing, you know, usually what people do is they use LSTMs as a backbone for reinforcement learning algorithms. Using transformers has several advantages in offline and or online reinforcement learning algorithms. So usually you have some sort of a state right here. So you have your history with states and actions and rewards and so on. And an LSTM will take in that state and, and action, or well, let's just Let's do it something like this. So you have state action reward, state action reward, state action reward, whatever you did in the past, right? So an LSTM will take that in and it will propagate its hidden state through times. I realize some of you youngsters might not actually know what an LSTM is. This is a recurrent neural network <laughs> that processes one time step at a time. And then here, uh, at the end, you're supposed to output whatever the next action is going to be, right? You have your history of actions, you're supposed to output whatever the next action is going to be, and you're going to get back a state and a reward along with it. And then you incorporate that right here into the next action. So if you train this thing in any way, let's say Q learning policy gradient, whatnot, uh, if it's a Q learning, you're not going to output an action directly, you're going to output Q values, that's a minor modification to the A. Um, what you have to do is you have to, and that's the difficulty in reinforcement learning in general, you have to somehow make a connection between the rewards you get from the, let's say this action gets you a reward, the reward you get from the action to some, something that you, you predicted. So you predicted several, you predicted an action here and an action here, right? These are these actions. Now, just because you get a reward from this action, it doesn't actually mean that this action was the smart action or the good action, right? If you are in a chess game, uh, it's not the actual last move that is the good move, even though that move gets you the all the reward. It, the, cur the crucial move might have happened 20 moves before. So the, the underlying reinforcement learning problem is to assign that reward to which action was actually the smart action such that in the future you can take that more. So maybe this action right here was the smart action. So you need a way to figure out that that was the smart action. And, you know, back propagation over time will do this. But in an LSTM, you can see right here, you need to back propagate, you know, through one, two, maybe three different uh, computation steps in order to reach there. And now this is three steps, but think if the good action was 50 steps ago or 500 steps ago, this quickly gets um, gets tricky. Normally, we can unroll LSTMs like this for maybe, I don't even know, like, like, a, not more than a couple of dozen steps, right? So it gets tricky. So what people do is they use what's called dynamic programming. And that is a thing that here with the sequence modeling approach, we're going to ditch. Um, and this, this is uh, one of the fundamental things. So instead of having to just learn from the reward and assign it to an action, what you're going to do is you're also going to along with the actions right here, you're going to output a value. And the value tells you sort of how good you are doing. The Q function in a way is already a value. So if you're doing Q learning, you're doing this automatically. And then the way you learn this is called temporal difference learning. So, you know, 
let's say this is the this here is the final stage of the game okay so you always get a reward here it's maybe plus one here it's minus five and so on okay now instead of back propagating only that reward back what you're going to do is at every step you want to predict a value obviously the last value is going to be equal to the reward itself but here your value is sort of your expected reward in the future if you take uh, you know the, the good actions that you're going to take so here your value might be maybe negative 4.5 because you know you're actually no you're probably going to take the action that gives you a good reward right so you're, it's maybe like plus 0.9 because you're fairly sure you're going to take that good action and then down here it's maybe so you get five reward from going there um no, wait, that's the Q value. I said that's the Q value. So here your value is going to be something like plus 0.7. Um, so it doesn't really matter what the numbers are. What matters is that now you're not, your learning signal doesn't just come from the, uh, from the reward itself. Your learning signal is... You're, from here, you're trying to predict the reward, but you're also trying to predict the output of your own function, like one or two or three steps into the future. So if you've done an episode, and at the end you got a reward right here, you could, your value function right here, could try to just output that reward, but that's really noisy. So what you're doing is you're saying, well, you know, I have predicted a value here and here and here and here and here, so why aren't I training my value function to also predict these things? And by predict, I, I basically mean, so if, if I was in this value and this transition got me like a reward of something, then this value here should equal to this minus this reward because, you know, like that's... That's how the value is supposed to function. So you're trying to predict the output of your own value function. This also works with the Q function. This is the famous uh, Bellman recurrence relation where the Q function of a state uh, is equal to the, re the reward you get from performing an action uh, according to the policy in that state plus the Q function at the state that you're reaching. So again, with the same policy and the the R here is drawn from the action that the policy gives you, something like this. So the R is the result of performing the action. Okay, so this, fu this fundamental relation is the basis of uh, Q learning. And you can do, as I said right here, this is called temporal difference learning. So what they call TD. All of this is based on concepts of dynamic programming. We all ditch this here. And so it is important to go through so that you understand what we're not doing. Okay. Why do we need all of this? Why do we need the Q functions and the temporal difference learning and so on? Well, because it's really hard to do that credit assignment over long stretches of time. Now, in, we can see that this is the case with an LSTM, right? Especially if we can't backpropagate all the way through the LSTM. In a transformer, what does a transformer do? You have a sequence. What does a transformer do? It uses attention in order to look at a sequence at a whole, right? It, through the attention mechanism, it can route information from any sequence element to any other sequence element in a single step. So essentially, it technically could do this credit assignment right here in a single step if, and that's a big if, if anything fits into its context, okay? And that's, I think, one of the crucial criticisms of this paper right here, in that as, as, as far as, no, I don't think all it fits in all into the context, um, but you can see that there's a trade-off, right? You're able to do the assignment in one step, okay? But as soon as you would like to, uh, predict correlations and do credit assignment across longer spans than the context, uh, you need to resort back to something like the dynamic programming approaches right here, which they say they can ditch. Now, 
they don't only say that because their context is long, but that is when they say how the transformer benefits this instead of like an LSTM or something like this. This is the reason that you can do this credit assignment uh, in one step across the context. However, always think that statement has an if, if the credit assignment needs to happen longer than one context, like if the relevant action for the reward is more away, the transformer is out of luck because it doesn't fit into the context. And we would need to go back to something like this. Okay. But there is a second reason, of course, and that is the sequence modeling approach. And that is something I, I, I see at the core of this a little bit. So the, the causal transformer, you know, cool, it's a transformer. Okay, we could use any other sequence modeling approach. Now, viewing RL as a sequence modeling problem is a different thing. So what does this thing do? So instead of having a neural network that, you know, here is, here's the history, okay? This is the history. This is the rewards you got in the past and disregard the little hat on the R. It's the states of the past. It's the actions of the past. It actually extends into the past, okay? So this is the input you get. And you would get that in any other reinforcement learning algorithm. What you would get too is this thing right here, the current state, right? And this goes through a little encoder. They use the DQN encoder. So this is a little convolutional neural network, right, that encodes the state. So it's technically able to handle uh, very complex states and so on by simply encoding them into a latent space. Um, so there's no attention on the like on in the state space right here the, the attention really happens over the over the sequence it, Now from this right the classic RL algorithms They wouldn't have this from this they would try to predict an action that maximizes the future reward What this does differently is They say well instead of giving me an action that maximizes the future reward I want to I want to tell the system what reward I would like. And then it's not giving me an action to maximize the reward. It is actually supposed to give me an action that achieves exactly the reward that I have uh, presented. Okay, so I ask it for a reward and it gives me the action that corresponds to achieving that reward in the future. This is, is different, right? Be and I can still do... Uh, reward maximization by simply putting a high number there, right? I want to get a lot of reward and like 21 is the maximum in Pong, which this game is right here. So you can say I want to achieve 21 reward. Please give me an action that achieves 21 reward. And that will be corresponding to getting as much reward as possible. Notice that you do need to know the maximum reward. Um, it doesn't actually work if you just would put one billion, 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 uh, as we will like as the, their experiments kind of indicate. So that's a drawback of this. Now, uh, just want to go back to this paper that slipped in uh, just by accident. I have this open right here uh, by Schmidt Huber. Don't predict rewards. It says just map them to actions. So they say. We transform reinforcement learning into a form of supervised learning, okay, which sounds like, you know, offline RL. By turning RL on its head, and did, uh, you look at this, <laughs> the memes are strong in this one, okay, upside down RL. I've actually made a video on upside down RL. They say, or standard RL predicts rewards, while whatever this is, instead uses rewards as task defining inputs, together with representations of time horizon and other computable functions of historic and desired future data. Uh, RL -le 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 learns to interpret these input observations as command, mapping them to actions um, through supervised learning on past, possibly accidental experience. Okay, so uh, this it is actually, I, of course, this isn't by accident. So uh, I knew this paper right here. And when I read this paper, it immediately 
uh, sprung into my mind. And uh, Schmidt Huber also, I, as I see it, wasn't the entirely first who did anything like this. Like we've known about goal conditioned reinforcement learning for a while and so on. Uh, so this is not necessarily a new idea. They do reference Schmidt Huber's paper very briefly in in this paper, uh, staying stating that it's kind of a Markovian approach and and so on, even though here you have Markovian interfaces and here you have non Markovian partially observable interfaces. Um, and the advantages that Schmidt Huber names right here are very much the same. For example, they continuously say they don't need discount factors. And here also you have no problems with discount factors and so on. So I, I wanted to point this out. And I wanted to point out that the paper is referenced in this paper. Uh, but essentially, here you have the three components, the component is offline RL, plus a transformer, um, plus viewing the problem as a sequence modeling problem by conditioning on the reward. So why does this make sense to condition on the on the future desired reward? Well, it makes sense, first of all, because in classic reinforcement learning, why don't we do that? Why don't we we say, I want to get this reward, please give me the action to it. Because it's a lot more work, right? If I just want to maximize my reward, I need a function, right? I need a neural network. Here is my state. Here is my neural network. Maybe it's a policy gradient method. Um, give me an action. And that action is supposed to maximize the reward. So now I need an additional input, the desired reward. And also give me an action. Now the network doesn't only need to remember what do I need to do to perform well, it needs to be able to distinguish what do I need to do to perform well, what do I need to do to perform a little bit worse, what do I need to do to perform terribly. It's a lot more stuff to remember for the network. The hope, of course, is that with all the the advances we've seen in sequence modeling, um, that essentially these transformers are capable of of memorizing or, or learning all of those different things. We, we know that transformers are almost unlimited in their capacity to absorb data and learn stuff. So the hope is that uh, these models will be capable of learning that thing. The neck at doing this though, is this is a technique that naturally maps to offline reinforcement learning. So offline reinforcement learning in general is a harder task than online reinforcement learning, right, for the reasons I outlined. However, this particular thing lends itself extremely well to the task of offline reinforcement learning. So what do I mean, if you have a history, you take one history from here, and it says, well, I was in this state, I performed this action, I got this reward. I was in this state, and then I came to this state, I performed this action, I got this reward, and so on. Okay, what you can try to do, and what Q learning tries to do, is it tries to somehow learn the the Q function that takes state and action conditioned on the history, and sort of uh, predict the future rewards, and so on. So it tries to figure out what it needed to do, instead of doing what this agent did in order to achieve higher rewards. So it is sort of trying to look at the agent that it, it sees critically and be like, mm, uh, you probably didn't do something well there, but it has no way to act in the world. It has no way to, to go out and try it itself. Instead, this thing, it simply accepts, it's like it accepts the history. It simply says, oh, well, you did these things and you got this reward. Okay, cool. Um, and if you know anything about these sequence models and transformers that they can memorize stuff uh, quite well. So going forward, uh, maybe think of these what these transformers do as simply memorizing the, the training data set. Okay, I know it's not the case, but uh, you memorize the training data set. Well, now, if you memorize the training data set, and you're in this situation right here, you see a history, you see a state, and the, the sort of the, the human tells you, I would like to get 21 reward. 
what the transformer can do is it can simply say, okay, let me go into my training data set. Let me find some, let me find some uh, sequence where the agent uh, was in the same kind of history, also was in this state, and also ended up getting about 21 reward out of the future actions. Now, what did that agent do? Well, it did this action, okay? It, and it's reasonable to assume that, you know, if you're in the same kind of history, and uh, if you want the same reward as that agent got, you should probably act the same as that agent did, okay? It, it is a lot like behavior cloning, though behavior cloning still focuses on sort of getting high reward, as I under, understand it. Um, so it, it simply takes what comes in as expert demonstrations. Whereas here, you just, you accept the history as it is. And if you're in a new situation, you, the question to the sequence model is essentially, how would a sequence that uh, evolves like this, okay, that evolves like this, how would it continue in the training data set? And what it will give you, it will give you the action that agents who were in a similar situation and ended up getting that similar reward that you want to get. Um, those, what did those agents do? Just do the same thing. And you're probably going to end up in the same place as they did. Okay, that's, that's the approach right here. Um, you can see how this is, is useful, right? Though, again, it, it only given that we ditch all of the RL, um, th given that we ditch all of the RL mechanics right here, uh, which they claim as a positive, and certainly it is a positive, you don't need to parse out what you needed to do and so on. You simply accept history and say, okay, I'm going to do the same kind of things. Um, instead of that, if, so I, I just said, I'm going to look at agents that had the same kind of history and were in the same kind of situation. Now, if you think about back about this problem right here of the context length, what if the future reward right here is crucially dependent on an action you did back here, right? You could have two agents that have the exact same history as far as the context reaches back, but done a different action back here. And the sequence model would have no trouble, uh, sorry, would have like no chance of differentiating between the two. It, they look the same, okay? One agent ended up with a really nice reward, the other agent ended up with a really bad reward. Even worse, it, the data set couldn't contain an agent that ended up in the bad reward, but had you done Q-learning, you could maybe figure it out from other trajectories. So as much as they, I feel as much as they tout the ability to ditch uh, the whole mecha like the whole machinery of reinforcement learning right here, you run into the same problem. Like even with this, like all of this, it does not alleviate the problem. If you want to go beyond how far you can backprop, uh, you need to you need to use the dynamic programming approaches, okay? Like I, I don't see a way around it. Maybe I'm terribly wrong, um, but you know. So the the transformers are good for doing the credit assignment over the longer distances than the LSTMs. Um, yes, uh, certainly, but that's valid for online, offline RL, and so on. Whether you do sequence modeling or not, uh, it doesn't alleviate the problem that these approaches were trying to solve in the first place. Though the sequence modeling approach is different and does bring like a, a different view on the problem. And again, you can do the sequence modeling approach because it, there is hope that with these transformers, you can actually absorb that much data and, and learn from that. So that is sort of the thing we're in. That, that was actually already the, the technique right here. We were not even past the, the first page. And that is, that's already the thing. You get this data and there, like you can deterministically, you can see that, right? You can deterministically transform this into the format they want. So this state, action and desired future return or future return you simply look into the future which you can do because it's a data set and you sort of calculate what the the future reward is 
at this particular time step. So you can easily generate that training data. Then you can use classic sequence modeling in order to do that. Their idea of what happens is encapsulated again in this um, in this thing right here. So this is a very, very example problem that they come up with. So they consider a task up here of finding the shortest path in a on a directed graph, which can be posed as an RL problem. Okay. Um, the reward is zero when the agent is at the goal node and negative one otherwise. We train GPT model to predict the next token in a sequence of returns to go, which is the sum of future reward, state and actions. Training only on random walk data with no expert demonstrations. We can generate optimal trajectories at test time by adding a prior to generate the highest possible returns. They also say, see more details and empirical results in the appendix. I've looked at the appendix, nothing there. I've looked at the code, nothing there. Uh, just, just saying. I mean, it is a toy example to illustrate, but like, there's nothing there uh, of this example. So what they do is they have a graph. There is a goal. You're supposed to just find the, um, the shortest path. What you do is you just do random walks, okay? Some of these random walks will actually fail, like this one here. So the, all the rewards are negative infinity. Um, some of them will succeed, and then you can generate that training data, okay? So from here, the, all the future reward is negative four from this particular random walk you did here, okay? Here you start at a different location, also negative four because you're gonna take four steps. Now, what you do with this sequence modeling approach is you say, I want to start from this node. However, however, I would like to get a reward of negative three, okay? which is a lesser reward than you got um, all the way here. So what you're asking the model to do, and by the way, like I'm pretty sure this should say negative two to make their example compelling. Okay, um, but so I, I think there's kind of a flaw in this toy example, but I hope you can still see what they're doing. So you're saying I would like to get a very high reward or a low negative reward, I guess, a low magnitude negative reward going from here, which corresponds to finding a really short path, right? And what the model is going to do is going to look at its training data and says, well, was I in a similar situation? in some point, like in the training data set, and it's, it's going to find, yes, yes, actually, here, I was in a very much similar situation. Um, and, and so I wanted to get exact, actually exactly that reward. I was in that situation, the history is a bit different. But you know, who cares? Uh, now I'm here as well. And what did the agent do that then went on and reached exactly the reward I want? Well, it did this action right here. Okay, I'll just I'll just do that same action. This is just comes out of the sequence model, right? So it's the sequence model simply tells you how would a sequence that started like this continue, and it tells you the action, and then it looks at this thing right here, and here is a bit where it fails, right? They say each step gets you negative one reward. So technically, at inference time, at inference time, what you would do is you would look at um, here. So you get negative one from here. So here you will put negative two. So at the beginning, you have to specify the reward you want to get. And from there on, you can calculate sort of the next reward. Uh, they need this to be negative one right here, actually, because um, so let's just imagine that for some reason you got a negative two here, right? Uh, so they need this to be negative one because that makes their example. So the sequence model says, well, was I in this situation? at some point, and I got out, I got a negative one. Yes, I was here. And what did I do to achieve that? I went there. Okay, I'm going to go there. Ah, now I'm at the goal. Okay, and technically you find somewhat the shortest. Now this again, this doesn't, the example here doesn't work because you start with negative three, you're going to end up with negative two right here, that wouldn't match the blue one that would actually match this one. So you would not get the shortest path. So you should actually start out with an oracle knowing that the shortest path is negative two, um, that would, of course, not match any example you have in your training data, 
but the sequence model could say, well, this is kind of close to this, right? So the most likely action is still going to be the one right here. And then you take the one right here, and then you're in the negative one regime, and then you match this one right here. I hope you can see, right, how that, that figures out a bit. So this can also handle if you don't get the expected reward, which of course can happen, right? It's not everything is always deterministic. So uh, because you reassess after every step, you reassess, you ask sort of your training data set. And this is very much how we think of these big transformer language models. What they do is they sort of interpolate the training data set. So they stitch together different pieces of the training data set, which is, you can see that happening um, right here. Of course, you already saw the flaw, you need to know what reward you would like to achieve. And um, so, like, by the way, LaTeX is beautiful, isn't it? Uh, maybe that's just my thing. I don't, I don't recall that being like this. So the, by the way, the code is available and also the pseudocode, uh, big props. Here you can see that the decision transformer in blue in Atari lags a bit behind what they call TD learning. So this TD learning, that's the, the conservative Q learning and the behavior cloning, which they term BC. In the open, in the open AI gym, uh, it outperforms it a little bit. And then there's this key to door task that we're gonna get into in just a bit. So um, I just wanna quickly mention that their primary comparison here is this CQL. Uh, and they make a big deal about sort of not needing discount factors. And I'm not really sure what they mean. There are usually two different discount factors in these algorithms. So one of them is usually found right here in the objective formulation. So here they say, what we want to do is maximize the expected return, which is this quantity right here. Okay, so what you want to do is you maximize your expected future returns in the episode. Now, this is usually different. Some people formulate it as the expected um, return in the future, but discounted by a discount factor uh, that you raise to the power. So you, you're essentially saying the future rewards are less valuable than current rewards. And that gives you some sort of stability, but it also gets you short sightedness and so on. However, this is a choice. This is a choice of the problem formulation. Now I get people train with this for maybe stability reasons, and then they still test um, and actually report the undiscounted reward at the end. Okay, but I'm just saying this is a choice. And their choice right here is different from what CQL does. So CQL explicitly uh, maximizes the discounted future returns while they maximize the future uh, returns. I just want to point out that there is an actual difference here. The other difference is in the TD learning. Okay, so the, by the way, if you don't do this, if you don't discount your returns, um, you get the situation that you can you can cycle. So if, you know, if you if, if you get like positive rewards or, or zero rewards for certain transitions, it can just like, if someone is losing, okay, a game. So here would be negative one. This is the only two options. Um, either lose or, you know, go back here. Now chess has a built in protection against this, but other things you can just, the agent will just circle forever because it doesn't cost anything. And if it were to go here, it would actually lose. So you usually discount, uh, no, actually, that's not why you discount. Um, sorry, that, that is a bad example. But there are good reasons to discount future words. Here, you would actually implement some sort of a penalty like minus 0.1 for just any step you do. Um, yeah, but discounting, maybe you could, you could win. If you could win, the agent could still go in circles because, well, it can still win later, right? Um, yeah. In any case, that's one discount factor. The other discount factor is in the uh, TD learning. So right here, um, and that's a different discount factor. You say, well, I'm going to predict this next step right here. Uh, that's probably a pretty accurate description. And that reward here is quite a good signal. 
given that I am in, in this step right here. Uh, the next one may be a bit more noisy, right? Because it's two steps ahead and then uh, I could, you know, I could be doing different actions. Uh, maybe, maybe the transition is stochastic. So when I learn my value function from all of these different goals, okay, I'm going to value this target as a learning objective. Right here you have that recurrence relation. I'm going to value this target the highest. I'm going to value this one a little bit less. So I'm, I'm more trying to match this. Oops, sorry. I'm more trying to match um, this one right here, given that reward, then I'm going to match this one right here, giving the given the two rewards, okay, Be both should be accurate. So the value should match this the reward plus this one, the value should also match these two rewards plus this one. But the second one is more unsure. So the TD learning, usually you have uh, tech, uh, classically called another discount factor lambda, um, where you discount sort of future losses. And they say, we don't need the discount factor right here. I don't know which one, which one they're referring to. Uh, but what I want to point out here is that, yeah, the objective is different. So maybe they say, we can get by with this objective. I don't see that that's a choice of the modeler. And you run into problems with some environments if you don't have a discount factor. In any case, uh, you can see right here in the experiments, for, for example, this is Atari um, the decision transformer outperforms CQL in some respects, uh, it, it trails it in other ones. I mean, they also look at like these standard deviations are, are quite high. Um, in the open AI gym, it is a bit, it looks a bit better, uh, in that it, sorry, it does outperform CQL in quite a number of things. And also with less standard deviation right here. Um, yeah, also, they, they, they compare against sort of behavior cloning, where you retroactively only train on the um, best such and such percent of the experience. And they find that if you hit the correct percentage, which is not necessarily the only the best trajectories, if you hit the correct percentage, sometimes behavior cloning can actually give you a better performance. However, hitting that percentage, of course, requires another hyperparameter search. And you as an Oracle, you kind of have to, you know, you have to go and filter and you have to try out and, and um, you don't know, you have to have some sort of a validation set, whereas uh, the decision transformer is just one run. Now, throughout all of this, they're sort of touting that they don't need as many like searches and as many, f you know, like here, you need to choose that percentage, you need to figure it out. But if you look at their actual configuration of hyperparameters down here, they do things like, well, we have one architecture for these Atari games, but then we have a different one for Pong, right? We have a context length for these Atari games, but then a different one for Pong, because Pong is actually quite a sparse reward-ish game, okay, compared to these other ones. So they make the context length bigger in order to capture a longer history, because otherwise they couldn't differentiate the agents and they would need to use TD or some kind of dynamic programming, right? And then there's also this, this how, the return to go conditioning, like how much reward do you want to get? And that's a problem. Like, so here, again, they, they do something and this is like, they look at the baseline, they look at CQL, how much did that achieve? And then they just choose to achieve a multiple of that one. It's, it's like, you look at your competitor, at what you're compared to, and then you base your decisions off of the result of that. So, you know, I, I kind of get it. And also this multiplier they take, it is very informed by them knowing the games, right? In Pong, you know, you can reach at max 21. Uh, so uh, that's the they condition on the re re reward of 20. Uh, in in Sequest, it's, I think it's unbounded. So they, they do it 1.5 times the performance of that. And yeah, so... I'm not I'm like, I'm not saying this is invalid experiments, but like this, this looking at your competitor, and then basing crucial hyperparameters off of their performance. Ah. <laughs> but I'm sure it I'm sure it will work otherwise, but just know that you need to have a good idea 
of what reward you can even achieve and, and what's possible given your data set, right? So, so CQL also takes into account, like it also learns from the same data set and that's sort of how they know what's possible from that data set. Uh, yeah. So is this a problem that you need to know the reward? Can't you just put 100 billion, billion, billion? And the answer is no. You see right here, uh, this orange line is the highest reward that was observed in the data set. Now this is, is gamer normalized, that's why it's not like 21. Um, but here the experiment, it's actually a pretty cool experiment, is since you're not only maximizing reward, you can, you can ask the model to, to give you any reward you want. So the green line is what you wanted, and if the blue line is what you achieved, matches the green line exactly, the model always gives you the actions to, to make that reward that you requested happen. Okay? And you can see that green line and the blue line, they match pretty accurately uh, for a long stretch, which meaning, means that the this, this sequence modeling approach can really not only give you the max reward, but it can give you sort of any reward because it remembers all the sequences. Um, though probably not the lowest ones because you're actually learning from a DQN learner that has probably only good trajectories, okay? Uh, but you can see as soon as you go past the highest uh, observed reward, it not only does it stay flat, it actually drops down again, okay? And you can see that pattern pretty much anywhere where you have an orange line like this. So here, you, well, maybe you stay, maybe you drop down. Here it's that kind of seems like you stay. It's only that here in the C quest where it's a bit better, but like this is a gamer normalized score of three. Like a gamer would achieve 100 here. Um, but you can also see that sort of drop compared to the green line. So that means you can't just put 100 billion uh, essentially. So you need to know the reward that you're going for. Sometimes no problem, sometimes actual problem, okay? And that reward is not only dependent on the game, it is also dependent on the game, but it is also dependent on like how your data set is, that you learn from is structured. You need to know what your agent can achieve. They do some other ablations with respect to context length. They actually find that larger context length uh, helps. So if you don't provide a long context, the performance drops. It makes sense in that the transformer is able to match the history to observe trajectories better. On the other hand, a, a technically reinforcement learning algorithms, since these are in Atari, are fully observable if you do frame stacking, you know, technically an RL agent shouldn't, uh, shouldn't care about the more of the past, but you know, RL algorithms do, they're not perfect. Um, the last thing is that key to door thing where they show that, okay, there, this is a, an experiment, a toy setting. By the way, again, I did not find this in the appendix. I did not find code for this. So we actually, we don't know too much about this experiment, but as far as I understand, um, there's one room, there's two rooms, there's three rooms. In the first room, there's a key. In the last room, there's a door. Now, you're, you're thrown into the first room, you get to walk around a bit, then you're thrown into the second room, you get to walk for a variable length of time, and then you're thrown into the last room. If you have put taken the key and you, you reach the door here, then you get a good reward, otherwise you fail, okay? So the middle room is called a distractor because if you have something like an LSTM or if you have something like Q learning or something. So the, the, the problem with this, uh, sorry, Q equals R plus Q is that this sort of looks one step ahead, okay? This recurrence relation. That means if you have a learning signal somewhere way down the line, you need to sort of propagate. It's not backprop, it's actually you need to learning step propagate the fact that there is a signal back here all the way through these time steps in the past where a transformer can just go like boop okay uh, so this is this is an experiment designed to show that this really helps so you can see right here uh, they can analyze what their system says about the expected reward in the future so you can always ask it how probable is a given reward in the future and you can see whenever 
the agent doesn't pick up the key, it immediately knows, as soon as it gets into that second room, it immediately knows it's lost, no matter what happens in the last room. If it does pick up the uh, key in these two situations, it estimates a future reward of about 0.5. And you can see it does not degrade across the distractor room, okay? So no, no matter how long the distractor room is, does not degrade. Um, and that's the key difference between this and like, let's say TD learning, uh, Q learning approaches. It does not, it, it doesn't forget um, because there is no dynamic programming involved. And then, you know, in the last thing, if it reaches the door, obviously it says, well, that's a high value. If it doesn't reach the door, it changes its mind. Now I would have liked to see whether or not, and this is why I was keen on seeing the parameters of this, whether or not this right here is inside or outside the context length of the transformer they used. And I'm going to guess it's still inside because as soon as that's outside, or like let's say more like this, as soon as that's outside the context length, the, 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 the system has no, the sequence model has no way of knowing whether uh, that particular agent picked up the key. So it, it cannot predict anything. I think what, they're, what they want to show right here, sorry, that's an alarm. What they want to show right here is the fact that the attention weighs heavily on those frames where it picks up the key or reaches the door, which is fine, right? We can, we can get that, transformers learn that. However, here I'd really you know, like to see what happens if you go outside of that. And again, if you go outside of that, you're going to revert back to the old method. So ultimately the transformer gives you a longer context where you can do one step assignment of credit. But again, as soon as you exceed that, as with the LSTMs, as soon as you exceed these, you need the classic approaches. And I feel the paper is a little bit, is a little bit shady on the fact that uh, they get like a constant factor uh, longer context with what they're doing, but it doesn't really solve the problem, okay? In my mind, I might be wrong. Please tell me if I'm wrong. Read the paper for yourself. It is a good paper. I hope we can cover the trajectory transformer in the future. And um, with that, I wish you all the best. Bye-bye.